Hello and welcome to Revision Tips for SIPs Level 6, Professional Diploma in Procurement and Supply. This is Module 2, Global Commercial Strategy. And we're looking at Learning Outcome 2, which is to understand and apply tools and techniques to address the challenges of global supply chains. Now, global supply chains depend on the transnational movement of products. This means that goods have to move between territories to get across the supply chain. Government impose regulations to restrict and control the movement of various kinds of products. And as such, exporters and importers need to adhere to the rules and regulations set by the laws of the various territories that their goods pass through before it reaches the final consumer. So in order to assess the methods to analyze a global supply chain, we can use the steepled framework, which we will have seen in learning outcome one, and we will discuss it a little bit later. But benchmarking is now common practice in organizations as competitions in the business environment increases. And organizations are acknowledging that they're not always the best in all aspects. And there are other firms within or outside their industries that perform much better. So rather than just observe from afar, smarter organizations compare their activities to those performing better so they can improve. But it is a continuous and systematic process for evaluating products, services and processes. Organizations pursuing benchmarking will do the following. They understand how suppliers and customers view the organization compared to others. They learn where to invest and focus effort to get the best outcomes. And they see how the rest of the industry is performing and compare supply chain performance with others in that industry. <clears throat> there are four types of benchmarking. Internal benchmarking is mainly used in large corporations that have different units of production or services. It compares performance of a unit within an organization with that of another high performing unit for their organization. If one unit is performing better than others, practices can be transferred to other units for improving. Competitor benchmarking is next, and this form of benchmarking compares key areas of an organization with key areas of high performing organizations, usually in a competitive industry. So there are concerns around this form of benchmarking because competitors are not always ready to share sensitive information. And this is why benchmarking is often focused on key figures like statements, financial statements, which are public anyway. Functional ben benchmarking is a comparison of functional performance, that of a high performing organization, be it its customers, suppliers or other companies within the same industry or technological area. So, for example, an electronics manufacturer might benchmark its purchasing function against a construction company known for its effective materials management. And then generic benchmarking, the, this form of benchmarking compares business processes across functional and industrial boundaries. It transfers knowledge from one industry to another with the potential to identify new technologies or practices across the industry. Now, the process for benchmarking starts with firstly planning, determining the process to benchmark and measuring performance of your own process. Secondly, searching and identifying your benchmark partner. Thirdly, observing, which is understanding and documenting the benchmarking partner's performance and practice. And then fourthly, analysing the gaps and performance to find the causes. And the fifth and final step is to adapt to plan for the implementation of improvements and to monitor the progress. Now there are some advantages and disadvantages to benchmarking. On the plus side, it does improve processes, quality and productivity, providing opportunities to learn from others, inspiring creativity and places focus on change. But the downside, it doesn't really affect measure effectiveness, often treated as a solo activity, often a certain level of complacency and the chance of using the wrong method of benchmarking and it can foster mediocrity. 
So determining measurable outcomes for success. You know, outcome measurement is a systematic way to assess the extent to which a program has achieved its intended results. So measuring outcomes is assessing the extent to which supply chain processes have achieved its goals of timeliness, reduced waste, etc. So <laughs> to decide what to measure, remember that metrics should also represent results of goals, not just activities and inputs, show progress towards the intended purpose, but also demonstrate notable value increase in terms of cost reduction, quality, efficiency and effectiveness. And efficiency is about doing the right, doing things right, sorry. So it's the useful output per amount, cost of resources with minimum waste expense. Whereas effectiveness is doing the right things. And it's the degree to which something succeeds in producing the desired results. Now, outcomes define what an objective of programme intends to accomplish, and it can be done by using objective development steps, describing the inputs or resources needed and the activities to undertake, the outputs expected and the outcomes which show the programme was successful. So the inputs is what your business is going to need to execute the plan. Could be HR, budgets or timescales. The activities is what needs to be done. What methods will you use? What kind of support is needed? Outputs are the tangible expectations of the programme, whereas outcomes is the impact it will have on the organisation. On the right hand side, you can see the continuous cycle for improvement. This aim is to continuously improve the quality of performance in an organisation. Business have to cut supply chain and logistics costs in order to be profitable and apply lean manufacturing principles in supply chain and logistic operations as a method of cost reduction. A cycle of continuous improvement helps to identify and eliminate waste from the supply chain. This approach utilizes feedback, makes suggestions for improvement and takes ideas from customers and operations staff. When problems are evaluated, ideas and, um, and suggestions are generated and recommendations implemented lead into an overall quality performance. So obviously it starts with identifying the areas that need improving, going off and analyzing the data, which does include the causes and hidden mes messages, plan to implement the change to improve performance, and then finally to assess the effects by looking at feedback and gathering information. Now, de determining the metrics for performance is simply about knowing what to measure, choosing the variables that are most relevant to the activities or the organisation, measuring what we must have to purpose in order to use a tool for effective management. So the, the, the measures to cover different areas of performance in an organisation can be categorised into different focuses or different functions. So you've got your inputs, which look at things like capital, labour, raw materials. You've got the processes, assembly, maintenance, packaging and transport, and the outputs being product and profit. But not forgetting the feedback in terms of customer feedback, but also profit. Now, common types of measures can be quantity, which is the change in the numbers, i.e. sales or stock. Quality, which isn't easily quantifiable, but it's indicated by things like customer satisfaction or how many goods might have been rejected. Cost could be represented by currency, cost of production, price of a product. And time is about meeting deadlines, delivery periods, indicated by hours, days, months, or even years. <clears throat> so KPI measures how well an organization is making progresses towards its strategic goals. They're used to define the critical success factors. Different organizations have different missions and goals, and therefore KPIs will vary from one organization to another. But there are process KPIs, which look at efficiency of productivity, input KPIs, which look at resources and assets, and output KPIs, which measure the financial and non-financial outputs of a business. <clears throat> 
but your KPIs need to be smarter. I mean, we're probably all familiar with the SMART acronym, being that KPIs must be specific and measurable, attainable, relevant, and time-bound. But two new ones have been added, which is evaluated and responsible. So an evaluated KPI is where the objective is being assessed to determine the worth of pursuing the benefit to the organization and its functions. And responsible looks at the objective taking into account how the achievement affects the stakeholders. So moving on to service level agreements, a service is defined as an activity or benefit that one party can offer to another, and it's intangible and doesn't result in the ownership of anything. Now, this intangibility makes it really difficult to define what's acceptable and what's not. So in supply management, a supplier might deliver the specified goods, which is a measurable standard, but the acceptability of the service part of the delivery could be difficult to define. And this is where a service level agreement is useful. So, you know, some things might have different things needed to be done within 24 hours, a week, a day, whatever. But um, I guess the, the important thing here is that when you're pulling together your, your SLA, you think about your basic objectives or your overall objectives being, you know, the services that need to be provided. A description would include, you know, description of the service, where, by who and when. The performance, you should clearly state the expected standard of performance. <clears throat> and the compensation and service credits is for the SLA to be binding, there should be financial consequences in cases of failure to meet the standards. And then critical failure, if service performance falls well below the expected level, the customer could find that they have to pay for unsatisfactory overall performance. Advantages of SLAs is that customers and parties to specific services are clearly identified and attention is given where a particular service doesn't want, does, sorry, does not do what is intended to do. Customers have clear awareness of the service they will receive. The needs and levels of service required are very, very clear. It will be clear what adds value and what doesn't. And trust and understanding is fostered between customers and providers, which also helps you to monitor the services. But the downside is drafting them is very time consuming and expensive. There is a potential increase for bureaucracy and paperwork and a chance of internal providers being treated as external suppliers rather than colleagues. They may need staff training to overcome resistance and the need to identify the specific measurements. Now, performance monitoring is checking performance against the KPIs. Review is looking back at this performance over a period of time, and it can be carried out in a number of ways. Continuously, this is when it happens all the time. So in the context of electronic monitoring, tools, performance activities are recorded constantly and can be pulled as and when required. <clears throat> it can be done periodically, where you're conducting the performance monitoring after a certain period of time, i.e. a month, a quarter, or a certain stage in a process. Or post-completion reviews are common for project works. So after a project is complete, performance monitoring and review is conducted to gain feedback and learning points from the project and future use. <clears throat> One of the metrics for performance managers that's been identified is that there are a number of different tools that can be used to measure performance. So the tools chosen according to how applicable they are to the outcome being measured. <clears throat> and one of those is um, the balanced scorecard. We're gonna look at the EFQM um, and Six Sigma as well. So the balanced scorecard, what you can see on the screen here is aligning the activities of a business with its vision and strategy. So it, it's essentially where you use different perspectives, maybe, I don't know, customer, financial, internal processes as a way of measuring the performance of the supplier. So it's quite common to do this when you've got broad organizational initiatives, people initiatives and leadership success. 
So understanding the balanced scorecard from a financial perspective, it's really about the measure of creation of value for its stakeholders. Will the shareholders get a return on investment? Will it turn into profit? And from a customer perspective, it's about how effectively organisations deliver value to the customer. You've got internal perspectives about the value adding processes that are carried through the supply chain and also innovation and learning. But in terms of a supplier's balance scorecard, which is what you can see on the screen, for a supplier to meet ongoing expectations, they should be provided with feedback about their performance. So a scorecard measures some factors like quality, delivery, support systems, commercial costs, and suppliers will get a, you know, a rating out of a, a particular percentage. So in this example, vendor free is obviously um, performing really, really well. Um, <clears throat> so there are things that potentially we can learn from what's going on with vendor free to help maybe vendor one and vendor two who are struggling on some of these aspects. Now the EFQM is the business excellent model. It stands for the European Foundation for Quality Management. And it's used to guide organizations towards achieving a goal of excellence. It aims um, at sustainable excellence in which quality, effectiveness and sustainability are key elements. It measures gaps and progresses towards a goal. The model is based on nine criteria, five of which are enablers, describing what the organization does and how it does it to, to succeed. And four are results criteria covering what the organization achieves. So the enablers are the things that the organization needs to develop and implement its strategy. Leadership, strategy, people, partners, resources. The results are what the organization achieves in lines of its strategic goals. These are people results, customer results, society results, and the key performance results. Now, suppliers are part of your organization's external resource under the enablers, partnership and resources. So to use this model for performance management, you must develop KPIs and outcomes to determine successful implementation of your strategy, set clear targets for key results and segment results to understand performance of specific areas. And Six Sigma methodology. This is a statistical problem solving tool used to identify and quantify waste as well as indicating steps for improvements. Six Sigma methodology can be used for supply chain management to consider enhancing supply chain quality. Now organizations are now using Six Sigma to identify and eliminate waste and reduce variances in their supply chain. So it helps to increase efficiency in several ways by reducing waste, decreasing order fulfillment time, building a responsive supply chain and reducing errors. Now it uses a, a broad approach, uh, D-M-A-I-C, DMAC. So it's about defining, you know, what is the most important task or goal in terms of measuring it, what are our current standards, then analyzing it to collect information and conduct analysis improve shortlist solutions and use the best fit and finally to control which is continued monitoring and control now the macro environment is a broad environment outside the industry and markets it's also known sometimes as the remote environment because it exerts forces from outside your organization's sphere of influence and these forces are beyond the organization's control Changes in the remote environment are important to an organization because they can affect the industry and the market organizations operating. They can give rise to industries or cause them to fail. Now we looked at the steepled framework in learning outcome one. So if you haven't already watched that video, I would recommend you go back and look at learning outcome one um, because it goes into a deep review of each of those factors. Equally in learning outcome one, we looked at Porter's five forces. So this looks more at the immediate trading sphere of a, an organization. 
Um, so it's the competitive forces that are at work in, in, in the macro environment, but much closer to where the organisation operates. So it looks at industry dynamics. And he, you know, the, the person that created this, a guy called Michael Porter, he argued that the, in essence, developing strategy is to cope with competition, yet to view the competition has traditionally been firms offering same products or services, but that's not necessarily the right way to do it. So, you know, you can look at this framework to assess the attractiveness of an industry, but also look at whether or not there's a potential for profit. Again, this is covered in um, Learning Outcome 1. On the left hand side, you can see an industry life cycle. This refers to the different stages in which business operate. It can be understood at the stage of business. Each of these industries or business stages can last for a different period of time. So initially, the emerging or the startup stage is where new products emerge and they're due, they're, they're sort of unfamiliar to the public or the consumer. So demand tends to be really low. Um, startup companies experience low income and even negative cash flows and profits as they invest hugely in new products. The growth stage is where the business is attracting more customers and a bigger market segment. So you're moving into the growth stage. The products and services are now known to the market and demand starts to increase and price can go down, leading to more customers. Consolidation in the middle at this stage some businesses are still not managing to generate income. For others, the industry matures and cash flow and profits slow down. The business cannot continue. Um, some of those cannot continue and they close. So it just means that you've got fewer businesses left on the market. And then when it hits maturity, this is where the business manages to remain and become well established. You're reaching your saturation point your leaders in the market pushing out your rivals and products these businesses are well known for, prices are reasonable. And then the final stage, which is decline. This stage is where the strength of competition is declining. Some businesses will concentrate on their most profitable products or services so they can remain in the same industries. Some will try to acquire smaller companies so they become dominant. And some businesses that face losses will close or hope to be bought out. On the right hand side, we're looking at product life cycles, which they do go through similar um, stages as, as an industry, but industries can stay, but pro products can come and go. So, for example, an automotive industry has lasted for over 100 years and there's no sign of decline, but the life cycle of certain car models and individual brands will decline over time and be replaced by new products. And not all products follow the classic life cycle model. model. Some are introduced and fail literally instantly, while others shoot to maturity within a very short period of time, but then decline sharply. So there is no such thing as a typical life cycle. In the introduction stage, the new product is introduced to the market and is unknown to many, but it's probably bought by innovators who make up a small percentage of the market or early adopters. In the growth stage, when the early adopters try the products, the sales begin to grow and by informing others, they influence the early majority to buy, which rapidly causes sales growth. At this stage, new competitors get into the market to challenge the pioneer of the product. And to avoid direct competition, competitors may develop new market segments. So products are now used by early adopters. At maturity, the growth stage ends. The product reaches maturity when there is a high number of people buying the product at least once. The early majority have convinced the late majority who are not risk takers and will wait until they get approval of the product from others. And then finally, decline. In theory, according to the product life cycle, market begins to decline as new markets emerge. At this level, the market may perceive the product as old or outdated and may not be in demand anymore. The manufacturer who remains in the industry continue manufacturing 
and the users at this level are known as laggards. <clears throat> Very occasionally as well, products get a comeback and have an extension to their life cycle. Now, at the beginning of a product life cycle, um, organizations can take a different approach when it comes to pricing. You can use a price skimming strategy, which is when the price is very high. Um, and that's because many innovators and early adopters are willing to pay the price to own the, the, the latest or the newest product. Or it could be because it's a really well-known brand like Apple, you know, and you trust it, so you're happy to pay a high entry price. Conversely, you can use penetration pricing where the price is set really low to increase how fast it reaches the mass market. So you probably do this if it's an unknown brand that customers um, <clears throat> haven't bought before and don't trust. <clears throat> Cycles of competition and, um, are moves and counter moves that competitors use <clears throat> to deal with competition. And it's things like price cuts and limitation of innovations and some industries are very intense and far cycle of competition, meaning that industry structures are completely altered. Now intense, intensity in terms of competitive industries are termed hyper competitive. <clears throat> so competitors in these industries counter attack one another, destabling the industry and making it impossible to make sustainable profits. As a result, the cycle of competition concept is based on the fact that industry structures are not naturally occurring, but instead they are often created by strategies and moves by competitors within the industry. Now, sometimes um, sort of price wars in the cycle of competition happen when different products or different geographical markets are involved, and this is known as multi-point competition, since competition happens in multiple points. <clears throat> in the cycle of competition, competitive forces change over time, so your organization's source of competitive advantage could also change over time, and you could be forced to respond to a new challenge to restore your competitive advantage. We're now going to look at the regulatory influences on global supply chains. So you've got imports on the left and exports on the right, you know, imports, foreign goods and services bought into a country from another and exports is goods and services sold outside the country of production. But import and export license are official documents that are used by the government to allow the movement of goods in and out of their countries. Each license used or issued details the specific type of goods and the total volume to be allowed in or out of the country. <clears throat> so the purpose of licensing for imports and exports is so that governments can control what is moving across its borders. There are several rules and regulations that have to be met before a trader can be authorised to import or export goods. So the main reason for having import licences is to protect domestic industries, to control sensitive goods like hazardous items, to ensure compliance with the country's quality standards, and to ensure compliance with the regulations of international agreements and to regulate the imposition of duties and tariffs to control the performance of a given industry. So controls through import and export tariffs and duties, I mean, a tariff is a kind of tax. It's leveled, levied on imports and exports. So the word tariff is general, it's used to represent different kinds of costs for different commodities. Any person who buys any product will incur an additional tax cost as a tariff for the product. But a duty is similar to a tariff, but levied on specific types of goods. For instance, <clears throat> there may be duties on financial transactions or the sale of estates. They are different types of duties depending on the role that they serve in trade. So the different types of duties and tariffs is that you can have an import tariff, a tax or duty on imported commodities, and an export tariff, a tax or duty on exported commodities. The ad valorem tariff is a tariff expressed as a percentage of the value of the traded commodity. Specific tariff is a tariff expressed as a fixed sum per unit of a traded commodity. 
and a compound tariff is a combination of ad valorem and specific tariff together. Now the operation of global supply chains are regulated by different industry regulators and international organisations. Industry regulators are government or private sector organisation that impose, impose rules and control operations within a given industry. Meanwhile, international organisations have some control over the operations of activities in a specific industry in which they operate. Now, <clears throat> there are some international bodies um, similar to sort of local industry regulators, but Traditionally, international trade was regulated through bilateral treaties between countries that want to trade, have a good trading relationship. The most significant international organisation that regulates trade in the world today is the WTO, the World Trade Organisation. But before that, it was the GATT, which is the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade. But World Trade Organisation re replaced GATT in 1995. There are five main principles that guide the WTO operation in controlling global supply chains. So we've got non-discrimination. The World Trade Organization requires that countries avoid non-discrimination trade policies towards its member states. Reciprocity is the principle to reduce the risk of free riding by requiring that countries reciprocate positive trade policies towards its member states. Binding and enforceable commitments is the agreements are signed in the organisations and are legally binding. In terms of transparency, the World Trade Organisation members have to be transparent about their trade regulations and respond openly to any information needed by other members. And then safety values, under specific circumstances, member states can be allowed to enforce measures in their trade regulations to protect their economies. Now, the regulations that impact on the employment of people in the majority of countries across the world, employment is highly regulated and by the represent respective governments, and they all have different laws and regulations that govern the treatment of employees. It's important to understand the different types of regulations that affect employment across the world, from discrimination, equality and diversity, redundancy and dismissal, working time and payment, health and safety, minimum wages and modern slavery. But if we start with discrimination, equality and diversity, in a contemporary economy, the conventional workplace is made up of people with different personal characteristics and cultural backgrounds. So that's going to comprise of people from different races, ethnicities, nationalities, ages, genders and sexualities, among other differences. And it is essential to have a working environment that is inclusive of all people, regardless of their differences. So equality is a state of being equal in rights, status and opportunities. Diversity is understanding that every individual is unique in terms of their personal and demographic characteristics. So these are essential components of a well-functioning, productive organisation. And then laws and regulations on discrimination can help to create an inclusive environment because discrimination is, you know, it's being prejudiced or unjust treatment of people based on their individual characteristics. Now, businesses operating internationally must also understand employment law in relation to issues of redundancy and dismissal. Organisations have a right to decide when they can employ people and dismiss them, depending on the operational need. But similarly, employees have a right to fair dismissal. So most governments have de developed laws on redundancy and dismissal to protect both employers and employees. So redundancy is when an employee's services is no longer needed. And dismissal is when an employee is fired as a result of misconduct. There are a number of laws on redundancy and dismissal, so you must make sure you operate within these laws, within the country in which you operate. Now, international businesses must also be aware of the employment law in relation to allowed working time and the compensation of employees. A majority of governments have such employment laws to protect employees against exploitation. The rules on time allowed to work ensure that employees work for a reasonable amount of time and receive overtime 
for extra work that they do. <clears throat> so the working time relates to the amount of time for employees to work. Overtime is the additional time above and beyond their normal working hours. And then payment is the financial compensation given for the work that's been done. And all employees are entitled to a work environment that is health and safe. And there's legislation on health and safety to design and ensure that health and safety of employees is protected. These laws give employers the duty to develop a safe workplace for their workers. But in the majority of countries, the responsibility of ensuring health and safety is usually on the employer to make any necessary adjustments to the workplace to protect employees. <clears throat> so generally, employers must have a policy that reflects recent legislation, have it relevant to their setting, undertake and act on risk, and support their staff in understanding and implementing legislation. And employees must take responsible care of their own and others' health and safety, cooperate with their employees and employers, and carry out activities in line with instructions. And they must inform their employer of any serious risks. Now, employees in different countries pay varying rates depending on the wage laws of those countries. A majority of countries have developed minimum wage laws which govern the practice of employers in relation to compensation. Now, in particular, countries have laws on minimum amount of payment that employers need to pay for an hour, a week or a month work done. So the role of the minimum wage is to protect employees from exploitation by employers. In countries where the minimum wage law exists, employees are prohibited from paying a rate lower than the set minimum. So the minimum wage is the minimum wage required by law. The living wage is an informal benchmark, not a legally enforceable minimum level, but it's to pay a national minimum wage. The basic idea here is that there are minimum pay rates needed to let workers cover the basic costs of living. So this is about living above the poverty line. And then finally, modern slavery, a concept that is commonly seen as historical, but that's not necessarily the case. Over time, slavery is known um, and it happens right here. You know, some of the signs that a victim might be, um, uh, sorry, a slavery, uh, somebody might be a victim of slavery could include sort of signs of injury, abuse and malnutrition. Looking unkept, having poor hygiene or appearing in the same clothes being under the influence or control of others or not having their own passport or identity documents, appearing scared, untrusting and avoiding eye contact, being collected very early or late, returning at night, having inappropriate clothing for work they're performing and being isolated from the local community and their family. So modern slavery is the recruiting, sheltering and transporting of a person for compelled labour or commercial sex through the use of coercion, fraud and force. It affects over 40 million people around the world. So our role in procurement is to, you know, have influence over and visibility of our supply chain decision making, especially over what level of due diligence is done and how suppliers and tenders are evaluated and assessed, and in establishing business systems to deal with these risks. So we can address modern slavery in the supply chain through the three Ps, which is policies, processes, and planning. From a policy perspective, we put in place policies to prevent, detect, and eradicate modern slavery. We establish processes to identify vulnerabilities, and we plan for situations where corrective action is needed. So what you might want to do here is to try and map out your supply chain. Now, the visibility of tier two and tier three supply levels is not transparent to an organization. So to improve the visibility of your supply chain, you need to map your direct supply base, which is your tier one, map their suppliers, which is the tier two and beyond. Because modern slavery can happen in a very subtle way doesn't have to include violence, but it could include coercion 
of people to perform some form of form of labor with no pay and that's a form of modern slavery so that's the end of learning outcome two thank you for watching